As I announced in Bible class this morning, um, next week uh, we will not be here. We'll be celebrating our anniversary. So Ed Rogers will be uh, speaking for us. I'm glad that he uh, chose to uh, visit with us in the time that he is looking for a preaching job himself. And so uh, I'm going to seize on that opportunity and let him come and fill in next week so that uh, Jennifer and I could uh, spend some little time together. And we appreciate uh, his offer to do that so very much. Mark chapter 4, you see one of the many miracles that you find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Jesus performed to verify that he was indeed the Messiah that he was indeed the Son of God. And when you look at Mark chapter 4, as we're going to look at the the text this evening of of verses 35 through 41, you see in Mark chapter 4, there are parables that he teaches. He's teaching the people these parables and these lessons, and he spends a great deal of time giving them instruction And it says there in verse 33 of Mark chapter 4, And with many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable he did not speak to them. And when they were alone he explained all things to his disciples. So Jesus was preaching the word, using parables, earthly illustrations to to teach a spiritual truth to the people. And we see in verses 35 through 41 that Jesus was going to go on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, to give you a little bit of interesting facts about the Sea of Galilee, it is a very large freshwater lake, about 40,000 acres, about 15 miles long and 8 miles wide in the central Jordan Valley. It's about 640 feet below sea level. And as a result of that, with the valleys that are there and the mountain range surrounding it, when windstorms would come up, the geography of that area would funnel the wind so that intense thunderstorms would come up on the Sea of Galilee very quickly almost without warning. And so that's what you find there. And some of the waves that that come up, even today some of those storms will come up on the Sea of Galilee. They could be seven foot waves coming up on the sea. Now anyone that's done any time in a boat, you don't want to be in a boat in a situation like that. That's dangerous. But of course, they did not have the instruments and the technology that we have today in which we could see a storm coming. But even if they did, they come up so quickly because of the geography of that area. And it says in verse 35 of Mark chapter 4, On that same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. This is the evening time. Jesus is exhausted. He had been preaching and teaching the people. And because he was human as well as divine, he needed to sleep. He needed to get get rest like all of us do. And so he says, let us cross over to the other side. And in verse 36 it says, Now when they had left the multitude, he took him along in the boat as he was, and other boats were also with him. Now we read a little bit further down that Jesus is going to fall asleep. That he is going to sleep. Now as you're going out in the evening and the nighttime and you're out on that huge sea, I want you to think of the word of silence. Think of the word silence. The silence and the, and the tranquility that's there. And the opportunity for, for Jesus to rest. And he is there asleep. But then in verse 37, suddenly a great windstorm, it says in verse 37, arose and waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. 
So they're going on the other side, and then a great windstorm arose. And that geographic area, they, the winds would funnel in, and, and those storms would arise very quickly, as we said earlier. And as a result, you have a storm hitting the boat. Now, I want you to think of this when it comes to our life. As we read this historical account about the life of Christ, we can go along and, and things are silent, things that seems to be going so very smoothly, then suddenly a storm hits. Suddenly. Out of nowhere, just like on the Sea of Galilee. It could be a financial setback. It could be a disease. It could be the doctor saying you have cancer. It could be losing a job. It could be a disappointment in people that you thought you were, that were your friends and they turn their back on you or they stab you in the back. It could be a number of things that happen. The storms of life come upon us suddenly broadsiding us. Sometimes we, we don't see it coming. And that's exactly what you see here. The silence is broken by this sudden storm that comes upon the boat. It was filling. Anyone who knows that if you're in a boat and the water starts filling in, there's problems. You don't want the water coming into the boat. Look at verse 38. But he, that is Jesus, was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? There's the Savior. There was silence. Everything seemed very tranquil. Then the storm suddenly. But they had the Savior with them. They had the Savior with them when that storm hit. And that's exactly what we find in our life as well. When those storms hit us, those unexpected things, those inexplicable things that hit us, whether it's physical or financial, whether it be because of school or because of our job, or no telling what, the Savior is there. And we can go to him. Now, we can't exactly go to him the way they did because he, he was physically in their presence. And I'm not suggesting in any way that we pray to Jesus as we would the Father. The Bible makes it very clear that we pray through Christ to the Father. But the point is this. He is that one mediator between us and God. He is that high priest that we go through, Hebrews chapter 4, that tells us that he's sympathetic to our condition. He knows what it's like to be tempted. And therefore the Savior is there. And so for us to get access to the Father, for us to get access to God, we've got to go through the Savior. And the Savior is there. And so they wake him up in verse 38. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Does Jesus care? That song we sometimes sing. Oh yes, he cares. Yes, he cares. Verse 39. When he arose, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. Serenity. There was silence, suddenly a storm, they accessed the Savior, and now there's serenity. A great calm. Jesus was there to bring peace. He says to the storm, the elements of nature, peace be still, and that massive storm dissipates. And there is a great calm. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the one that can give us peace. He is the one that gives us peace between us and God. There is no peace without Christ. No true peace. And so we see that Jesus is the one that we have to go through, that we have to uh, access of that peace. It is through Him that we receive that peace. Look at verse 40. But He said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? He's rebuking them. Rebuking them for their lack of faith. How is it that you have no faith? 
You know, sometimes as Christians, and, and I can be this way, when, when something disappointing happens or something tragic happens, we act like we're atheists. We act like we have absolutely no heavenly father. We act like that we are on our own on this and we've got to figure it out ourselves. And that's not how it is. Where is your faith? Why is it that you have no faith? And in Matthew chapter 6, he talks about the necessities of life. It says, don't be anxious, don't worry about these things. And in Matthew 6 and verse 33, he says, here's what you're to focus on. You seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the necessities of life will be added unto you if your focus is right. If you're following Christ, if you're putting him absolutely first, then you'll have that peace. You will have the serenity of that sweet peace that comes from the Savior when we put our faith in Him. And in Matthew chapter 6, we find He also says, Why do you worry about these things, O you of little faith? There's the problem too. Sometimes our faith is not big enough. And we have to realize that Christ is the one that can bring us True peace. He is the one that we can turn to when the storms of life come upon us. Verse 41 says, They feared exceedingly and said to one another, How can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who who is this person? How can this person speak to the elements and they obey him? Well, he's the son of God. He's the one who created the world. John 1 verse 1 and 2. He is the one who is the firstborn over all creation. Colossians chapter 1 tells us. That is the faith that they had to grow into. To understand that was not just an ordinary Jewish rabbi in their boat. That was the son of God himself. Now I want you to turn over to 2 Corinthians. As we we look in the life of Paul and we see... This happening in the life of Paul and the contentment and the serenity that he finds from the Savior, even though he had to face the storms of life himself, he was not alone. And 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 24, as he talks about the things that he has suffered for being an apostle, he says in verse 24, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, He says, from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. He literally had to face storms. Not just symbolic storms of life, but literal shipwrecks. Verse 26, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils of, in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Verse 27, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst and fasting, often in cold and nakedness. Besides all this, verse 28, Eight, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. All of these storms bombarding him. But he knew the Savior was in the boat with him. He knew that he was there. And you look at chapter 12, same book, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 7 through 10, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Much discussion has been brought about concerning what was that thorn. What was the problem that he had? It's not revealed, and I think there might be a reason why it's not revealed, what exactly that thorn in the flesh is. It might be because we can identify. We can identify with it if it's not specifically revealed what it is. Look at verses 7 through 10. Because he's receiving these revelations, it says in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation, revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. 
that thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, was allowed to happen to Paul to keep him humble. Verse 8. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Verse 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches, in needs, in persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He knew the Savior was in the boat with him. And so he accessed that strength that was there. And therefore he could endure any storm that he had to face. And so we see him saying this to us in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. In prison he's writing this. One of those storms of life. He's in prison for being a Christian, for being an apostle of Christ, for preaching the truth. He's in prison and he writes one of the most positive letters in the New Testament. The book of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. The key phrase, the key word through the book is rejoice. And he says there in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness, gentleness be made to all, made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now tie that in with Jesus being in the boat. The Lord is at hand. He's right there. He's available. Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And what will be the result? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, the focus has to be on Christ Jesus. And when you make your prayers and your quest known through Christ Jesus, and you take the burden off yourself and cast your cares upon Him because He cares for you, and you're praying through Christ Jesus to the Father, then you have peace. That sweet serenity. No matter the storm, because the Savior is in the boat with us. Perhaps there's someone here tonight that needs to obey that Savior. He is available. The Lord is at hand. He will save. But you must come to Him in obedience to His commands. You must believe that He is the Son of God and make that confession with your mouth. You must repent of your sins. And you must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Baptized into Christ, into His death. Raised up from the water just as he was raised up from that watery grave to walk in newness of life. If you've done that and you've gone astray, perhaps you're facing a storm. You're facing a storm in your life. The Savior is in the boat. And you can have access to that peace that he will grant you. Come to him. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand and sing.